Uh, hi, Bob, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much for helping us with this uh, plan that we're starting today. Morning, thank you. Uh, so good morning and good afternoon to all of you. My name is Reinaldo Rangel and I am the Commercial Director of Conservatorio. In the name of our company, I would like to thank uh, the uh, 49 people that are already connected at the moment. Uh, we have a subscription of 140 people at the moment, so I believe we will be receiving connections in minutes. Uh, this is a great platform that we are going to start using to connect and share knowledge with the industry, with our partners, with our uh, suppliers, and also, and more important, with our customers and the community. Uh, and we will listen a lot about the, uh, the community. Uh, regarding the agenda, and uh, Harneet, if you can pass the presentation, uh, regarding the agenda, we're going to be reviewing three topics. Uh, first, we're going to review the urine retail best practices with Bob. Then we're going to share uh, conservatory strategies that we're implementing at the moment uh, to manage the current situation. And we're going to open a 20 minutes uh, Q&A session. And to really help us uh, connect with those questions, you have a Q&A section uh, in which you can just write your questions and Harneet is going to be helping us at the end to collect all those questions and ensure we're covering most of them. Uh, if not, we're going to be answering uh, the rest of the questions through email. Uh, next slide, please. Harneet. Okay, so Regarding the, uh, before going ahead with the, uh, with the presentation, I'd like to share a brief uh, summary of our company and why we decided to uh, launch this webinar. To those that do not know the company yet, Conservatory is a real estate developer uh, established in Panama since 2004. The initial projects were focused on the revitalization of El Casco Antiguo or the Old Town District of, of Panama. And throughout the years, and after achieving very successful projects, the company began to expand into the rest of Panama and also into other countries in Central America. Um, Conservatorio is a real estate, as, as I told you, as a real estate developer that started focusing on a very deteriorated neighborhood, the leaders of the company realized that Conservatorio had an enormous responsibility with the community. And it became obvious the enormous leverage uh, and lever that the real estate industry can pull towards social progress. So now with this situation that we're living with COVID-19 uh, and, and as an unprecedented situation, this reinforces the purpose of our company. And more than ever, we have the right and, and are at the right timing to pull that lever. So, the first message that I wanted to give the group and the, the attendants is that this is the moment to work with your communities to really solve the different situations that we're facing, uh, not only in Panama, but across the world. Um, what is most more obvious to us is that we operate uh, in, in what we call a urban ecosystem, where customers and community are the, the exact same thing. Uh, and, and people who live in the neighborhood, shops in the stores that our tenants have, uh, and those that work in Casco and own the stores buy and rent our apartments. So if anyone in the chain gets sick or have a problem, and specifically an income problem, uh, we all suffer. So the question here on how to help people and businesses is also the same question that we have on how to help and survive uh, in, in this situation. Um, we think that on all the landlords and, and the same situation that we're living, uh, can you pass the presentation, uh, Karnit, to the next one, please? Yeah, we, we think that on all the landlords uh, are in the same position uh, in one way or another. Uh, 
so the the in connection to this message uh, we decided to really go and set set up these webinars to bring the best knowledge and the best practices in our market and and at this time we have the privilege to have bob gibbs or mr robert gibbs uh, best known as bob uh, by his close friends uh, he is one of the 100 most influential urbanists in the United States and his company Gibbs Planning Group has advised more than 500 town centers and historic cities in the U.S. and abroad. Bob is also a lecturer at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and is author of the great book called Principles of Urban Retail and Planning Development. Uh, he has also been co-author of other e-books. So today, Bob will share with us the impacts and the trends he's seen in the U.S. market after the COVID-19 impact, and, uh, and will provide us with some recommendations to overcome the situation. After his presentation, I will share some of the strategies we're implementing at Conservatorio to keep our tenants in business and also our community vibrant. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Gibbs. Robert, screen is yours. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me for this important webinar. Can you control the slides, please? Yes. Uh, next slide, please. As a part of this webinar, I'm offering all of the participants 30 days of free online consulting. If you want to send me an email um, with a photograph or with an issue that you have with one of your projects, I'd be happy at no charge for the next month to respond uh, to your issues. My email is below and I will um, also attach it at the end of the presentation. Next slide. Slide. Uh, the retail industry is in a huge crisis, as I'm sure you know. Last month, about 50% of the sales uh, were in decline from the quarter before, and it's expected that retail sales will drop another 25% by the end of, pan of the pandemic. Next slide. Um, the, before the pandemic, the average uh, U.S. mall uh, produced about $3,500 per square meter per year. That's considered the bare minimum to survive uh, with a retail store and to earn a market rate of return. Since the pandemic, those sales have dropped more than 90% for in-store sales, and uh, they're up by about 20% for online sales. Next slide. I was trained, uh, I'm a landscape architect, but I was trained and worked as the director of planning for the Taubman Company. The Taubman Company is an American shopping center mall that has the highest sales per square meter of any uh, shopping center developer in the world. And we treated shopping as a science, where we studied with video cameras and remote sensing how people behaved in malls, and we learned really how to control how people behave in malls. We learned how to make them turn right, how to turn left, how to slow down, how to go fast. And we combined these uh, human behavior principles with best practices for shopping to produce very, very high sales. Um, next slide. Since uh, the last recession in 2008, about a third of my business has been working for shopping centers that have uh, gone out of business. And uh, this is an example of one that I've worked on in the US where this center has been open since 2010 and it is 98% vacant. And uh, this has become very common uh, we estimate that about 30% of all U.S. shopping centers have filed bankruptcy uh, in the last eight years. Next slide. If you're a small retailer and you want to pay yourself a living wage and have a, a reasonable return on your investment, 
you really should have sales of about 3,000 US dollars per square meter. That's about $10,000 uh, uh, per square meter. Uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's about $1,000 per day that you should have to make a market rate of return. Next slide. We find that the average small retailer only produces about $800 a day in sales. And uh, that that's only about $850 per square meter per year. At that amount of sales, it's not enough to earn a market rate of return. And very often the small independent retailers don't pay themselves a living wage and they would earn more if they worked for a retailer at, such as Walmart or a big box store. These small retailers now are closing very rapidly and there are going to be millions and millions of highly skilled restaurant workers, chefs, store managers, retail salespeople that have great skills for opening new stores and running stores, um, but have lost their jobs due to the pandemic and the recession. We're forecasting that many of these highly skilled workers will try to open their own businesses in more affordable space in cities and small towns and shopping centers. And our shopping center developers right now are seeing uh, numerous calls, they're receiving numerous calls from unemployed chefs and restaurant workers who wanna open uh, businesses. So we think there is a silver lining to the pandemic and that it will create an overwhelming demand for new businesses in city centers and small towns. Next slide. The average outlet mall uh, does about $24,000 per square meter per year, an extraordinarily high profit for them. They pay uh, very low rents. They only pay two or 3% of their sales and rents, which is less than the average of eight or 10% for shopping centers. Next slide. The average Apple store uh, has sales of $50,000 per square meter per year. The Apple store in New York City has sales of $660,000 per square meter per year, and that's in a basement with no windows. Apple stores have such high sales that Wall Street will not let the mall owner count their sales when they calculate the average sales in the mall. Very often a Walmart will represent 20 to 50% of the entire mall's sales. Next slide. Uh, the internet sales uh, last month were 45% of all sales for apparel and department store type goods. That would be cosmetics, uh, electronics, books, linens, anything you can buy, jewelry, anything you can buy in a department store the internet right now is about 45 to 50%. It's only 9% of all retail sales, but that's misleading because it includes uh, large items like cars and furniture. Next slide. The average uh, mall is expected to close in the US. I don't think this will happen in Panama, but it's estimated that by 2025, 50% of all American malls will close. The US has about 2,000 shopping malls and about 1,000 of them will be closed within the next five years. Next slide. Because of this change, and because they're losing so many shops, the mall developers are building plain white stores with electronic signs because they're changing tenants almost every month. This is an example of a mall in Ohio, and that's an electronic sign, and the entire store is a plain white box because the, the developer has such a high turnover in the space. A new phenomena has been for mall developers to lease space to online only retailers. Retailers that only sell online are now going into malls and they're only being charged the percentage of increase in online sales in that region. So these tenants are going into malls and they're paying zero base rent 
and they're paying a small percentage of the increase in online sales in their region. Uh, this is going to happen, we think, across the board, especially in cities. Next slide. These are the closed brands that have closed in the last uh, year in the United States. Uh, last year, 600,000 stores closed in the United States. It's forecast that about a million other stores will close. Next slide. These stores are booming though. Uh, the Wayfair Furniture Store, eBay, Zappos, Craigslist, uh, Amazon, uh, Warby Parker. There's a number of retailers that are thriving in spite of the uh, decline in retail sales. Next slide. Uh, what do millennials want? Millennials are the youth that are in their 20s. And millennials are telling us that they like shopping online or they like shopping in exciting places. Millennials very much dislike shopping in malls. Next slide. They like to spend their money on experiences like hiking, going to Europe, traveling, and skiing. They don't like to spend their money on material things. Next slide. Uh, millennials like hanging out in cities, especially in alleys and edgy places. Um, Detroit is booming right now uh, because it has really great alleys and it's a little edgy. Next slide. Millennials very much dislike shopping in strip shopping centers like this. They find them boring. They feel that that's something that their grandparents like to go to. And it's forecast that about 60 to 80% of these big box power centers will close in the next 10 years because what they sell, electronics, books, uh, toys, sporting goods, office supplies, can easily be purchased online as a commodity. Next slide. Millennials like hanging out in cities. Uh, when we design restaurants for them, we have to design it with the chairs facing the back of the wall so that they can look out over the table and see people. They very much like interacting with people and they like being seen in urban conditions. Next slide. Millennials are very cheap. Uh, unlike their parents whom are yuppies uh, who like to pay a lot for things, Millennials like to pay very little. One of their favorite stores is H&M, where you can buy this black dress for $13. Uh, these dresses are a little on the cheap side. They may not last very long, but they're very stylish and they're very, very popular with millennials. And the H&M store was opening stores across the world, mostly in cities. Next slide. Uh, millennials like to dress down. They like to wear blue jeans with holes in them. They like to wear vintage, old-fashioned uh, clothing they buy in secondhand stores. And they like to present the image that they are uh, not very wealthy. This is a complete shift from what their parents and grandparents wanted, who wanted to dress very stylish, and they like to wear brands like Polo and LaCroix, and they like to wear their brands on their clothes. The millennials don't like wearing brands and they like looking like they're not very wealthy. Next slide. This is a new store uh, in Connecticut that just caters for millennials. And millennials love buying blue jeans that look like they're very old with holes in them. And even though these blue jean shorts are $150, millennials can't buy enough of them. And we're seeing a very big change in the way stores are merchandised. The displays have vintage old pipes and old racks, and they're uh, displaying new merchandise to look like it's a secondhand vintage store. Uh, you cannot buy this sort of look online. It's something that millennials like to touch, and they like going into stores rather than buying things like this online. Next slide. Uh, millennials and their parents and their grandparents like in the US and shopping outdoors, even when we have extreme weather. Uh, and the, this is a shopping center we designed in Michigan 
It's called the Village of Rochester. We designed it 20 years ago. And in Michigan, it's very cold. It's very often um, 10 below zero Fahrenheit. Um, but millennials and many like to shop outdoors. We think in the post-pandemic scene that outdoor shopping will greatly eclipse mall shopping because there's a perception that it's safer, that you're not inside an enclosed environment. And surprisingly, these open air town centers have higher sales per square foot when they're in cold climates where it snows a lot, where it rains a lot, instead of in warm, mild climates. They do not do very well in Florida, but they do very well in cold areas with extreme uh, temperatures. Next slide. Uh, young families right now are uh, very stressed for money. Usually one of the parents has lost their job and young families are uh, looking for cheap things to do for entertainment and that tends to be going outside and exploring either a historic district or a downtown or a new town center. Next slide. Young families like hanging out in new town centers. This is one in Atlanta, Avalon. We had nothing to do with it, but the town centers that are being built today uh, have national brands and cinemas, and they always have squares and places where young families can hang out for free and have a good time. These places have higher sales per square meter than shopping malls. Next slide. The seniors right now are also very stressed for money. They're living longer and they're afraid they're gonna outlive their income. Seniors are spending a lot of time with their grandchildren and they too like to hang out in cities or open air town centers. Next slide. Seniors very much like living and working if they do work in places where they can go downstairs and shop on a main street. And the apartment builders in the United States are trying to build all of their new residential units in town centers like this. These achieve densities of about 50 to 100 units per acre, per US acre. And uh, the rents for the residential are much higher than the suburbs. And we're, for, we're forecasting that in the post-pandemic world, that uh, these mixed use town centers with office, hotels, residential, retail, and restaurants uh, will very much boom and be very much in demand. Hotels in these centers tend to have higher occupancy rates and offices rent for about 30% more when it's in a town center than in a suburban office park. And that's because the office uh, users can attract more talent. The millennials like working, living, and shopping in either new town centers like this or in historic city centers. Next slide. Uh, this is an example in Washington, D.C. of an open air new town center. The luxury retailers like Hermes and Louis Vuitton and Gucci find they have much higher sales when there's an open air center. And I realize it rains a lot in Panama but our research is showing that even in areas with extreme cold or with extreme rain or extreme humidity, when well-planned outperform shopping malls. And we think in the post-pandemic um, environment that enclosed malls will not be able to compete with these poor tenants and high sales. Next slide. It's very important in a city center or a uh, outdoor town center to offer an experience, to, to offer uh, high quality art, high quality landscaping, interesting building designs and streetscapes so that the customer has an experience that they cannot get online. Uh, we have found that our, this is a project we're working on in Mexico, in Monterey, Mexico. And we have found that art increases sales by about 15 to 25%. Next slide. The discount stores like Walmart and Target are running to the cities. Um, they're building smaller stores. This store is 3,000 square feet. So what is that, uh, 30,000 meters? Um, 
now this is 30,000 square feet, excuse me. This is very common now for the big box stores to go into cities even where it rains and where it snows. Next slide. Uh, Walmart is the largest retailer in the United States. About 50% of all Americans go to Walmart once a week. Next slide. Target's new store is called the City Target, and they are opening this as quickly as they can in small, medium, and large cities. These are about 25% of the normal size for a Target. Next slide. H&M, uh, again, is running into the cities. This is the H&M in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, this is very common that the leading brands, like even Ikea, is opening now in cities uh, with a much smaller brand. Uh, so these retailers find that the millennials love shopping here um, and that the empty nesters and baby boomers and seniors also like shopping where they can have an experience. It makes the customer feel like they're buying something special and that they're having more fun than just shopping online. Next slide. The major retailers like Williams Sonoma, this is a luxury kitchen store, are also opening in cities. But the luxury stores only want to open in cities that are safe and that have very high streetscape designs and building standards. They build very expensive stores with beautiful historic storefronts, and they only want to go to cities that have rigorous standards for sign design, windows, and materials. They will not open on a main street that lets cheap buildings be built there. Next slide. Uh, the basic standard for storefronts, as the architects will know, is to have at least 65% or 60% of your store with clear glass. Uh, if you have to tent it, uh, it will hurt retail sales, so use an awning or an interior a shield. Uh, we find that storefronts that have a dark, glossy background, like black, dark gray, dark blue, dark red, have higher sales than stores that are painted beige or tan. And this sort of luxury, historic uh, storefront promotes higher sales and it makes the customer feel like they're getting an experience they can't get online. Next slide. Storefronts don't have to be expensive. This is a, a very modest store in France in an alley. And uh, these stores close at night to uh, make the store safer in the evening and daytime they just open these up. It's very important though that uh, the, the uh, landlords or the retailers have talented architects design the storefronts, and talented architects can meet low budgets with good design. Next slide. Uh, this is a book I published, uh, Urban Retail, where we go through all of these principles. It's available online at most booksellers, and um, I recommend that you buy it. We go through the various uh, typologies of shopping centers. Next slide. I teach a class at Harvard a three-day class that's open to the public. We have a lot of people from Panama attend the class, and it's going to be October 22nd to October 24th, this summer in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, if you have time, I would encourage you to attend. We bring in some of the top retail shopping center developers, restaurant owners, and retailers to give uh, lectures. And it's about uh, 35 hours of sessions. Um, you can send me an email and I can send you a link or you can go to the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Next slide. We are the Gibbs Planning Group. We're based in Detroit, Michigan. We're a small planning firm that specializes in planning uh, mixed-use retail centers or downtowns and we offer uh, market-based research on what's supportable in cities. Next slide. Uh, we also host an institute. It's called the Urban Retail Institute. We post every day new research on our Facebook site. Please join us. It's a free site, Urban Retail Institute on Facebook, and you will find uh, up-to-the-date research daily. Next slide. This is my email, rgibbs at gibbsplanning.com.
www.ethicalcoachingcenter.com. Please, I encourage you to send me an email if you have an issue, if you have follow-up questions, if you want to send me photos. Uh, I'm offering free advising online for the next 30 days for all of those that you participated in this session. Thank you. Is, I think that's the last slide. Next slide. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you very you much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you. And thank you for sponsoring me for this webinar. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for participating and very useful presentation to us uh, and to really understand further what are those uh, activities that we need to implement now that we need to recover a lot of the consumption uh, that has been lost uh, during the past two months. Um, we're going to be covering some of the questions that the people are asking at the moment uh, at the end of my presentation. I will be covering a 10 minute presentation just to share, as I previously mentioned, uh, some of the strategies that we are implementing to keep our tenants in business and the community vibrant. Um, as mentioned before, uh, please, next slide. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, Conservatorio was founded in 2004 uh, with operating projects uh, right now on, on, with a developing value of $350 million and managing a gross leasable area of around 85,000 square meters, uh, not only in Panama, but also in Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, the business uh, is, is as any other business in which we analyze, we finance, we do a lot of design and developing, development and research. Uh, we work on marketing, sales, and leasing projects. And we also administrate uh, the asset management. Uh, but more importantly, uh, despite all the elements that are basic to any company, uh, such as finance, accounting, technology, sustainability, uh, we are very focused on social and cultural and environmental impact. Uh, that, is, that is something that uh, is very, very important to us uh, before generating all the profits because. Working with them has teach us to really uh, implement projects that are very successful. We are also a certified B corporation, and uh, we can explain further in a series of webinars that we will be launching. I'm sure that we're going to be covering that section uh, with, with more details. Next, please. Um, as I was explaining, uh, there is a value chain that we need to ensure that happens in the market. And uh, we divide this into two. One is to create value for our customers and investors. And the other side is to share that value with our community and ensure that, uh, that all those communities are receiving, uh, are, are perceiving that their uh, areas are protected uh, that we can provide affordable housing, that we can create platforms for social cultural partners uh, that can work with us and really ensure that we are executing properly our, our project. Now, with the COVID-19, which is uh, something that is impacting uh, not only Panama, but the globe, and we believe that it's going to be having a long-term impact uh, until the vaccine is available, we need to learn how to live with, our, with an ongoing health crisis. And at the same time, we need to revitalize our local economies. Uh, this, to us, will not depend only on governments, but also on the private decisions or the private sector decisions. And, and, and to us, it's, it's critical that uh, that we work with uh, with the tenants very closely as a head of the commercial department my objective right now is to keep 100 percent of the company tenants and help them to reopen their businesses as soon as the government eliminates the current sanitary restrictions uh, to achieve this goal uh, we have been working uh, with a very simple philosophy whether we like it or not we need to be partners with our tenants. We need to have a partnership with our, with our tenants. And rents always are related to, uh, to sales. Uh, and, and, and whatever sales our tenants will be having will generate 
a, 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 a profit to them and at the same time will generate will generate what uh, they will be able to pay uh, as a rent. Uh, so ultimately, the consumers will be the ones deciding uh, how much we will be able to charge for our properties. Uh, so to work uh, this properly, we will need to work in a, in a very, very creative way with our tenants to really attract the customers and, and to really have the better chance of succeeding in, in the market. Uh, we realized that this philosophy with a lot of communication and flexibility on our part and openness from the tenants uh, to share information is crucial. Uh, because if we don't have the knowledge and the understanding of what is happening to them, we will not be able to create the proper solutions. And trust and collaboration will be the critical part uh, to be really creative after analyzing the different situations that, uh, that the business is, is having. So we know right now that sales have declined uh, from 80 to 90 percent to 95 percent in restaurants. Uh, in the case of retailers and services providers, it have, they have been closed since March 25th. So uh, considering that situation, um, we believe that they're not being able to pay uh, the rent. Uh, so considering all the scenario, we are uh, implementing three actions. The first action is that we are being rent flexible. And, and that flexibility is uh, that during the quarantine, uh, we will be charging maintenance fees only. And this is very difficult because we all have uh, um, uh, elements to be paid in our businesses. But uh, if we really go and, 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 and put a lot of the stress in the situation of our tenants, definitely they won't be able to pay. Uh, the other, the second element uh, of, of, of our actions uh, has been to adjust the rent model. And we're gonna base uh, this new rent uh, on a percentage of sales. Uh, and this is something uh, we believe is gonna be helping our tenants to continue in the business and maybe in the permanently we will be implementing this uh, for the following month but at least for this year uh, to really ensure that we are kind of working on this together, we will need to implement uh, the model. Uh, the last thing that we are doing is to create alternatives uh, to cash rent that our tenants can use uh, for them to pay us. And this is, this is uh, something that is part of the creative solutions that we believe uh, we will be uh, uh, discussing with our customer. And what we need to do is that we need to ask our retailers to understand what are those sur surplus times or merchandise that they have that we can use to attract customers to strengthen uh, the, uh, the, the, the solutions that we're going to be offering to our customers. So we believe that, that leftover foods, yoga classes that are simply out there and we can start using those activities to attract our customers, we can start doing those digitally and then convert those into solutions that they can be using to pay uh, rents. Uh, and this is something that is going to be taking me to another uh, um, activity that we're working on uh, and that we're a program that we're working on that is called Buenas Obras uh, or Good Deeds in, uh, in English. Uh, I'm going to be covering this but before uh, going into Buenas Obras I would like to go specifically into a project that is called La Quince. So if you can go to the next slide please. Next one, please. Next. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna explain you for a minute uh, what La Quince is before, before, please. I'm sorry. Okay, so La, La Quince, it's a project 
uh, that um, we're building in, in uh, Santa Ana. And, and to give you a little background, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a zone, an area uh, that has a, have, had and has at, at the moment a lot of social needs. In Panama, uh, this is located in the Panama Historic District, and, and the project is uh, called La Quinza, as I mentioned. As you can see in the picture, uh, the area uh, was, was very, very in a bad situation. And what we're building are the uh, solutions that you're seeing on the bottom of the, uh, of the slide. Uh, you're having five buildings that we're building in the area. And those five buildings are going to be bringing more life to the area, more activities, not only on the residential side, but also on the commercial and on the offices uh, area. So um, next slide, please. Recognizing the, the needs that this community have uh, in, in, in the market, uh, we have been working together with, uh, diff with an ecosystem of NGO partners. And we have Voces Vitales, uh, uh, Fútbol con Corazón, Fundación Esperanza, uh, Casa Santana, uh, that those organizations that really has helped us interact uh, with the community and understand what is the need, what are the needs, and what are the type of relationships we need to uh, create to really go ahead with uh, with with the construction of our projects. So the next slide, please. So if we go specifically into the idea of Buenos Obras, Buenos Obras uh, or the Good Deeds program, uh, it's a program that we activated very very fast. Uh, once the uh, COVID impacted our, our market. And, and Buenas Obras is no, no, no other program than just connecting with the community, understanding what the needs were, then the needs was specifically food. Uh, and, and what we did is that we created a program to improve the well being of this community uh, while boosting the productivity and the local economy. So, what we did was that. Uh, after analyzing all the needs and the families in needs and connecting with the local uh, community, we created the program, uh, we created a currency model uh, to really be, be used by the consumers. And then we created a digital platform in which they could interchange products. Uh, so by this uh, solution, we were able not to give only product to the consumers, but also get their support uh, on solving uh, different activities in the, in the market. Um, to explain you further, how, how does it work? Uh, the, the idea is that, uh, that, that consumers can really go and, and, uh, and, and, and define what are their needs? Uh, consumers are connected to, to uh, the information that is being offered on the platform. And then we just provide with, uh, with a solution uh, for, for the consumers. The, the challenge that we have right now is how to expand this program, how to really connect this Buenos Obras with the tenants that we're having. And if we go to the next slide, what uh, we are planning to do at the moment is that we would like to ensure that we are going to generate uh, solutions not only for uh, the Santa Ana area, but also for the San Felipe uh, um, area and, and the Casco Antiguo. And the idea is just to um, connect the landlords the local NGOs, the residents, and the business, and ensure that we are going to be uh, asking uh, the uh, tenants on how to create solutions that they will be able to uh, implement and to really uh, um, execute to boost the economy and to incentivize uh, those donors uh, that will be able to participate in the program 
and, uh, and produce more solutions for the economy. Uh, on top of that, what uh, we did, and it's on the next slide, please. Um, next slide. Uh, okay. No, no. Previous. Okay. The other activities that we implemented were uh, solutions uh, with uh, Casa Santana. And this was one of the first actions uh, that we implemented, implemented it, uh, benefiting 1,000 families living in the area. Uh, this was an integrated donation campaign that was developed to support disadvantaged families in Santa Ana. Uh, we were able to implement this in a very record time. Uh, this was definitely a real team, teamwork, not only with Casa Santana, but also with 43 community volunteers and leaders that help us connect uh, and deliver the bags to the right families in, in real need. The campaign is still on, and we need more support to continue helping the community. Uh, just go to Instagram and type Da Si Puedes, which is the name of the, uh, of the campaign. Uh, and donations starts just at $5. So give if you can. And, and, and I believe that uh, with this, we can really help and connect with the community. So connecting the community, connecting the needs of our our tenants will be uh, a huge solution that we're going to be implementing. Um, with this, uh, uh, we, we finalized the presentation of the activities or the strategies that we are doing in, uh, in, um, in Santa Ana or in Conservatorio to help our, our tenants and the community. And I would like to open the next uh, minutes for Q and A's. I believe that Harneet has all the Q&As. Uh, yes, I do, Reynaldo. Thank you. So the first question is, how sensitive is downtown retail to a perceived incidence of crime in a given area? It's generally very sensitive to high crime areas um, for most groups, except for uh, teens and millennials, and they're okay with that. But generally, it's very important if it's perceived to be unsafe. All right, our next question is, in terms of technological innovation, what would be the most valuable tool or resource retail business can offer their customers right now? During the pandemic, they have to offer a safe, clean environment, which generally means curbside pickup or delivery. Okay, the next one is, in the case of open malls, which are the best anchors you detect besides supermarket? What changes in design you think will be important to consider with the acceleration of e-commerce delivery service like Uber Eats and transportation changes like Uber? In the open air centers, it's important that uh, there be protection from the environment with awnings or rain shields. It's important that the main street is actually a street that allows cars with on-street parking on it. The pedestrian only centers only work well if you have over 50,000 square meters of area. The best anchors are the supermarkets and grocery stores and restaurants um, or the center could be what's known as a category killer, where it's really dominant in one thing. It could be dominant in, in apparel and fashion, or uh, businesses for young families, or home furnishings, or neighborhood goods and services. Ideally, the open air center should be at least 10,000 square meters at a minimum, and the best size is about 200, is about 20,000 square meters. The absolute best uh, anchor would have been a department store, but since those are closing, that's not likely. So you could have an anchor such as an H&M or some online retailer opening in there. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do you see social distancing affecting the indoor malls and outdoor town centers? 
do you expect 50% of mall closings to accelerate? Do you see more than 50% of mall closings? I don't think more than 50% of the malls will close, and that's in the U.S. I don't know what it is in Panama. Uh, that comes from Credit Suisse that did that estimate. They probably have something on their website. We feel that the enclosed malls are going to be perceived as unsafe and that people, if they go to the malls, are going to feel uncomfortable. The advantage to historic districts or open air centers is that they are open air and that you can go there for entertainment, to be around uh, other people at a distance, and then to shop. Uh, versus in a mall, you primarily go there just to do shopping. Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, this comes from a user that says, I've read that Detroit will be one of the most affected cities in the United States due to COVID. One of the reasons is because it was in the process of retrofit for approximately 10 years. If this is true, what will be your advice to Detroit taking in your consideration, taking in consi your consideration, uh, your knowledge in downtowns, retails, et cetera? Yes, Detroit has been, I think, the third most seriously impacted COVID-19 city in the country. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It also, though, has been uh, one of the quickest to recover cities. And Detroit, uh, Detroit is booming because of a lot of investment and because it's a region of 5 million people without a real city center. Detroit is very popular with millennials right now, and it's been very popular with major employers uh, that need highly skilled labor. And the major, many national major corporations in Michigan have left the suburban areas to open up office in the downtown because that's necessary to attract talent. The Ford Motor Company, for example, is renovating a historic train station uh, in the Detroit's Corktown area uh, to attract talent. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is, what is your take on, on the future of dark stores and this type of space is now dedicated to delivery services? Uh, I, Many of the stores that are closing right now will not reopen as retail. Um, Ikea just announced yesterday that they're going to try to open and close department stores in malls. Ikea is in a big growth spend. But a lot of these closed retailers will not, the large ones will not reopen as retail. Um, they'll have to either be divided into smaller spaces so that these unemployed restaurants and retail, retail workers can open their own store. Uh, next question is, what's the best way to invert the old commercial areas with huge parking lots in front and bring in the new model of social experiences, not considering demolition? Those old centers built in the 1980s and 90s have twice the parking that's necessary today. And those centers lend themselves to be redeveloped as open air centers with medium density residential. And we're, we're very rapidly converting hundreds of old shopping centers into mixed use city centers with a lot of residential, some office, and about 10% of the retail that they had originally. Uh, connecting with customers on a human level will always be important for some industries. Now that people can't or won't come that often to a physical space, do you have any recommendations besides the traditional social media channels on how to connect more and better with customers during this new era? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think customers for a long time are going to be resistant to going inside malls or inside small stores. And the retailer will have to have a, a hybrid with about half of their sales online and about half of their sales in the store. Um, but having a brick and mortar store increases the online sales significantly. And it's going to be hard in this 
economy to have an online store only. You're going to need both a physical store and a online presence. How is the post-COVID scenario is going to affect internal retail spaces? Well, I think the I think the enclosed shopping centers are going to be very challenged uh, in this post-pandemic period. Um, I, I think that the uh, the future is going to be with either outdoor shopping centers or outdoor town centers or historic city centers where people feel like they can get outside and get fresh air and have direct sunlight. What do you think about the future of movie theaters? I'm very concerned about it. A number of movie chains have filed bankruptcy in the last two months. And uh, people like to go to cinemas for the social experience. It's more fun than watching a video in your living room. But I think they're going to be very challenged. And I think you're going to see a, a collapse of a lot of the uh, cinemas in the world. In your art, Harneet, yes. I believe we have two more minutes to finish. So let's, let's try to be, uh, to be close in the uh, questions. All right, so the, the last two questions will be great. Okay, last two questions. In your article, you mentioned the unemployment youth as potential tenants. What kind of incentive and help could be given for them to set up shop in empty downtown retail spaces, given the fact that they have little to no capital, especially in those places where severance package are quite minimal, unemployment insurance is non-existent, and personal savings are low? Those small, those small unemployed chefs and retail workers will have to uh, come up with some capital from friends and family. They're not gonna get conventional financing, but the landlords have to offer uh, some tenant improvement allowances and rents based on a percentage basis. And typically percentage rents are eight to 12% of sales. Okay. Uh, this last one is for you, uh, Reynaldo. Uh, Reynaldo, the percentage base rent that you mentioned Conservatorio is implementing is with a guaranteed minimum payment or without a guaranteed minimum payment? The idea is to set up uh, an aligned guaranteed minimum payment, but that minimum payment is something we're going to be open and flexible to discuss with all our tenants. And that's why we were considering to implement the Buenas Obras program so they can really uh, pay us and use the program to pay part of this minimum payment that we're gonna be asking them to pay. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from more people by sending me an email. And thank you for including me in this important webinar. Bob, thank you very much. In the name of Conservatorio, it was a pleasure to meet with you. Thank you. And thank you to the uh, audience uh, that we have during this meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Be safe.